In this talk, I'll talk about two things, as I mentioned. I'll uh, show how you can calculate exchange efficiently in hybrid DFT. Uh, and there are some sort of uh, algorithms that uh, go into doing this efficiently. There are like three different steps. I'll tell you what these are. Um, and then the second part, I'll tell you how in AFQMC, which you've heard about from uh, Shiva and other people earlier today, how we can uh, use multi-slater trial states to uh, systematically improve the, improve the results. So let me start with the uh, hybrid DFT part. So <clears throat> in DFT, or uh, let's start with uh, Hartree-Fock theory. In Hartree-Fock theory, your wave function is just basically a single determinant, which is constructed by several orbitals, molecular orbitals that you put together in a determinant. And like most things in quantum chemistry, it ends up being, Hartree-Fock theory ends up being a eigenvalue theory. So this is a Fock matrix and the orbitals are uh, eigenfunctions of the Fock operator. Except here, it is uh, of course a nonlinear uh, problem because the Fock operator itself is a function of the orbitals. So what you do is you take the Fock operator, diagonalize it, obtain the orbitals and their energies, then you fill up the orbitals uh, using uh, uh, Hund's rule uh, and, uh, and fill them up. And based on uh, what the filled orbitals are, you get a, a Coulomb operator and an exchange operator. Now already you can notice that the Coulomb operator, if you write it down in the uh, real space representation, Coulomb operator is a completely diagonal operator, whereas exchange is a is a uh, is a is a, uh, actually a matrix even in the real space, and the rank of the matrix is not small. It's equal to the number of uh, electrons, roughly speaking. So you can already tell that the exchange is going to be a little bit harder to deal with than the than the Coulomb part. Uh, so so in practice, how do we solve it? Uh, you, you have to introduce some basis functions, phi mu. Uh, and uh, in the space of these basis functions, you represent the molecular orbitals as a linear combinations of these uh, orbitals. And uh, when you introduce the basis functions, uh, the, the, the equations that you end up having to solve are the following. Uh, the Coulomb, uh, which was Coulomb operator, which was just a diagonal in the real space, becomes a matrix. Uh, and the expression for the Coulomb operator takes this form where these are the four, uh, uh, two body uh, uh, integrals given here. And this is the density matrix, which is just the outer product of the molecular orbitals. Uh, similarly, the exchange is also given by a similar expression. The only difference which looks very subtle here is the, uh, the, the density matrix sigma and lambda is being contracted by indices on one side, whereas in exchange, the sigma and lambda are contracted across the Coulomb operator. So one of the op uh, orbitals has uh, R1 function and one of them has uh, one, uh, R1 and one of them has R2. So sigma has R1 and lambda has R2. So this relatively subtle difference makes, uh, makes a pretty large difference in uh, what the cost of the overall method is. Uh, <clears throat> so, so the, so the, uh, the algorithm uh, of course looks like this. You write down the Fock operator which is given by the one body operator plus uh, Coulomb plus exchange, you diagonalize it, get these molecular orbitals, take the outer product, calculate the density matrix. Using density matrix, you can calculate the Coulomb and the exchange, and you do this until you reach uh, self-consistency. Uh, in DFT, effectively, the only thing that changes is you introduce this exchange correlation uh, potential. Uh, X, this is the empirical potential that uh, takes into account many body effects. In principle, it's exact. Uh, in uh, practice, it's uh, approximate, it's empirical potential. Uh, now, there is, a, there, there is a version of DFT which is called the pure DFT where the exchange is completely eliminated. And, uh, and in pure DFT, you just have a Coulomb and you have the exchange correlation functional. Just like Coulomb was diagonal in the real space representation, the exchange correlation functional is also roughly diagonal. Maybe it has some derivative terms, but it's roughly diagonal. So this X and J roughly have the same cost uh, when you evaluate it. K uh, has a different cost. So, so pure DFT is significantly cheaper than hybrid DFT just because it doesn't have the exchange uh, matrix. And here I'm just uh, showing you the relative cost of uh, hybrid DFT for various systems. This is uh, uh, cross 30 is just the 
cost of hybrid DFT divided by the cost of pure DFT. Uh, so as you go, um, system size increases, the relative cost keeps increasing quite rapidly. So not only the prefactor is quite large, the scaling is quite different as well. So this uh, prefactor keeps increasing as you increase the system size. Uh, here I wanted to uh, mention that uh, this uh, factor is 240 for CP2K. This is just on my laptop, you know, depending on your hardware, the factors might be slightly different. For quantum espresso, it's uh, actually much uh, lower. And this is mainly due to, I believe, due to the ACE algorithm, adaptively compressed exchange, which uh, Lin Lin uh, uh, came up with a few years ago. So, uh, but, but still, even with ACE, the, there's a factor of 30 when you want to do hybrid exchange. Um, and hybrid DFT is typically quite a bit more accurate. So if you do quantum uh, chemistry calculations, uh, the most accurate uh, uh, density functionals are usually hybrid. So people do want to use hybrid DFT, but often they can because it's quite, uh, quite expensive. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so, so uh, let me just uh, quickly touch upon the basis uh, functions. So I, I mentioned that you have molecular orbitals, you write them as a linear combinations of some basis sets. And there are several different types of basis sets that are used. Uh, Gaussian, plane waves, slaters, wavelets, Cartesian grids, all, all sorts of ba basis sets. The two most common types are the Gaussians and the plane waves. Gaussians are typically used in quantum chemistry community and plane waves are used in uh, uh, physics community. Uh, and and uh, if you want to use plane waves, very often you have to introduce what are known as pseudopotentials. So if, as you go closer and closer to the uh, atom, any, any atom, uh, the orbitals, the molecular orbitals are uh, qu become quite sharp. They have a lot of wiggles. And to represent those wiggles, you need very large plane wave cutoff. And, uh, uh, and so what you do is you get rid of this uh, internal part and replace it with the smoothly varying pot uh, orbital. So the, in the in, inside, the orbital looks quite different. But on the outside, where the chemistry is sort of happening, the orbital looks same as the true orbital, not the pseudized orbital. So, so plane waves have this advantage that they basically give you exact basis set uh, complete results, but with the caveat that you have to play some uh, funny games close to the nucleus, introduce pseudopotentials. Whereas Gaussians give you roughly exact uh, answer because Gaussians can treat this, these wiggles. So, so yeah. Say it's true as long as you take it takes me to go to large bases to see it. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. So I'll, I'll mention that point towards the, towards the end. So, uh, <clears throat> so yeah. So what I'm going to uh, tell you now is I'm going to actually use Gaussian basis sets. First, I'll tell you how I'll uh, speed up the exchange when you use Gaussian basis sets with pseudopotentials. Okay, uh, and so here you will, uh, uh, the, the reason we do this is because you can use plane waves as an intermediate basis. And then I'll very briefly sketch out, it gets technical here, but I'll sketch out how this algorithm can be extended to situations where you don't want to use pseudopotentials where you do all electron calculations. So let's start with the first uh, one. So this is, uh, this is your integral. Uh, you, uh, so uh, you do need uh, integrals or some integrals in some form when you do the uh, hartree fock or DFT calculations. And when the orbitals that you have are sufficiently smooth, because you have uh, removed the uh, wiggly part using pseudopotentials, then you can just represent the orbitals on a grid. So these uh, circular things are orbitals, and the, uh, you can calculate the values of these orbitals on the grids, and that basically represents your uh, true orbital. There's no problem. And here I've written the integral in this sort of uh, funny notation. So mu r is the value of the orbital mu at some grid point r. Nu r is the same thing. So here you multiply these two orbitals. You get the, uh, uh, the value of the product of the uh, Gaussians at some grid points. And then this is the potential energy. So given some density at uh, grid points r, you want the potential at grid point r, r prime. This looks like a n square matrix, but it has a very special form like this. So it can be done using FFT. So you, if, I, if I give you a density at r, you can calculate the potential at r prime in order n cos, not order, order n square, which is what you would usually require. And then uh, you do the same thing with lambda and sigma. So this is, conceptually, you can write down the integrals as, as follows. We don't actually ever calculate them. 
because calculating integrals will uh, usually will be expensive, so you write, the, write them down in this form. So just to sort of uh, tell you why Coulomb is so much uh, cheaper, so, so the, uh, you want to calculate this guy. So you take uh, d sigma lambda and multiply it with lambda r prime and sigma r prime. Uh, and this will give you the density at r prime. This is an order n cost uh, calculation because both lambda and sigma are local orbitals. So if you fix lambda, there's only very order one sigmas that are multiplying lambda with a, a non-zero value and you get the uh, row density on the entire grid. You saw, use FFT to calculate the potential on the entire grid and log n operation. And after you get the potential, you can calculate the Coulomb, which, is, which again follows the same sort of uh, property where mu and sigma are uh, local operators. So when you want to uh, sum, the, sum these up, so in, instead of integral, it should be summation. You want to sum these up, you get j sigma mu in order, order n cost. So this entire calculation is an order n calculation. There's uh, nothing too complicated uh, happening here. Zero. Yeah, you just uh, uh, you just throw that away. If you throw it, it's fine for the hard. That's what's up. Yeah, so so in, in exchange, you have to you have to keep it. So so there are several ways to do it. Uh, sometimes people use the truncated Coulomb, so it doesn't have a diverging G term. We do something very very simple. We uh, throw away the G term and then we add like uh, this additional. A term that depends on the overlap of the integrals and the Madelung constant. It's a very sim a simple thing. Uh, anyway, but, but that's uh, that's sort of a separate, uh, important but separate uh, separate problem. I'm just wondering because it's a source of error with different codes and how they treat it. Yeah, so the, uh, comparing different codes will be uh, yeah will be a problem. So you can compare in thermodynamic limit, but with finite size, it's it's a, a it's a difficult yeah. Uh, so what about exchange operator? Exchange operator, the calculation goes as follows. You now, uh, you, let's say I give you molecular orbitals. You calculate the molecular orbital on this grid. You just uh, contract the atomic uh, orbital as a density with the molecular orbitals. This is the n square cost because you need the n molecular orbitals on the grid. Then you apply the exchange operator on any given uh, uh, atomic orbital. That requires you to take a product of molecular orbital and atomic orbital, calculate that on the grid. Uh, that, that gives you density. Do the FFT to calculate the potential on R prime and uh, multiply it with the mo um, molecular orbital in R prime. So this is, this is the funny operator. This is a completely non-local operator. Uh, once, you, once you have the uh, exchange operator on R prime, you contract it with the second uh, atomic orbital. So this entire calculation has a cost uh, order n, n cube log n. And the reason is you have to solve n square Poisson equation. And each time you solve the Poisson equation, it costs n log n uh, cost. Yeah. Sandeep, n is the size of the grid. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, the n is a, is a placeholder for number of electrons, the number of bases, okay. the number of. Oh, okay. uh, uh, yeah. So the, here I'm not distinguishing. But you, you will in the end. I will, I will talk a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk about it. So, of course, the, what n I'm talking about here makes a massive difference. So th this is my next, uh, next point. Okay, so the fact that this is n cube is not, is not uh, a killer for us, okay? The, uh, so f uh, I'm giving you an example here. Let's say you have a 5,000 by 5,000 matrix. So let's say you have a l large enough system where you have 5,000 basis functions. You, uh, you do a, a, a blast opera, LAPAC operation to calculate eigenvalues. On a GPU, it takes about 0.6 seconds. On a CPU, one CPU takes about a minute. And this is an N cube operation. So the fact that uh, it's an N cube operation is not going to necessarily kill your code. Eventually, it will. But for sufficient, even reasonably large problems, it's a, it's a cheap uh, calculation. But of course, this N cube is where N is the number of basis functions. But if uh, you had a calculation where n cube was n number of grids, then of course it's completely unmanageable. So this n cube is not the problem, but what exactly the n is will, will uh, cause a problem. And here the, po here the fact that you have to do n square FFTs actually becomes very, very expensive and you wanna somehow avoid, this, avoid that uh, uh, process. So that's what I'm gonna uh, try to tell you. So, uh, so the, let me just summarize in one slide how are we going to make it cheaper. So the, this is the integral I've uh, written previously schematically. 
what I'm going to first do is get rid of the R here, which is the number of grid points, with some a small, hopefully a very small subset of uh, uh, special grid points, Xi. Okay, X, uh, X, Xi here. And uh, associate with each of these grid points, Xi, some numerical function that lives on the entire grid, uh, Xi R. And then calculate the potential due to that numerical orbital on grid points R prime. So uh, I have a numerical basis on R, uh, on the entire domain. I do FFT to calculate the potential due to that at R prime. So what I've done is I've replaced R here with Xi, which hopefully is sufficiently small. And this will reduce the, uh, I'll show you, this will reduce the cost of the calculation. I haven't showed you how to, cal how to find Xi. So now if you use this, you will have some uh, problems because your uh, uh, integrals are not symmetric uh, to when you go R1, R2. So if you take mu, nu on bra side, uh, replace them, exchange them, it's not symmetric. That leads to a problem that your exchange matrix will not be, uh, will not be symmetric. So you can symmetrize it by doing this. You can say, well, let me introduce the same approximation on the R prime side as well and you can get this, uh, this, uh, the, this set of integral. And you have an error epsilon, where the error is whatever the error is when you replace R with Xi. Even if you replace it on both sides, you end up with the same error epsilon. But the key observation here is you can now do it in a slightly different way that gives you an error epsilon square. And the way you do it is you do this replacement on the left-hand side, approximation on the left-hand side, plus and the same approximation on the right-hand side. Uh, so the, the, the sum of these two already will make your exchange symmetric, but now this is twice the, uh, twice the uh, value of the integral. And now you subtract this, uh, this, uh, this approximation from, uh, from the entire thing. So the sum of these two minus this will give you roughly the correct uh, integrals, but now the error will be epsilon square. And this is a very old trick, actually. Uh, so to understand this trick, let's say you want to calculate uh, AB, product of AB. And you, you can calculate B with the approximation B plus del delta. And you calculate A with the approximation A plus delta. So this guy, you multiply A with B plus delta, A plus delta with B, minus you, where you have error in both of them. If you do this, you get AB plus delta square. So this is the trick that we are using here. Okay. So th this actually, we will see, reduces the errors a lot. Uh, so the, the fir the, this first is called tensor hypercontraction. This, of course, quite uh, famous, was uh, uh, first introduced by Todd Martinez. This, where you just do it on one side, are, are called pseudospectral methods. This was introduced by Rich Friesner all the way back in 1985, a couple of years after computers were invented. It's like so long ago. and. Uh, and uh, this robust idea is actually quite common. It's used in several places. Uh, recently, I, was, uh, I, uh, uh, I got, uh, uh, learned about it with Ed Vallee's paper, but this goes back to Dunlap. In 2002, he introduced this idea in the context of uh, density, uh, density fitting. And in fact, uh, this idea is used to calculate uh, properties in uh, DMC. And that was introduced uh, by uh, separately and co-workers in 1979, so before computers were invented, all the way back in 1979. <laughs> so uh, so th this is an old idea, but it's, it's uh, quite uh, useful. So, let's, uh, uh, so let me just uh, tell you how we are going to find uh, these uh, Xi's. Okay? So th this, <clears throat> this, was, uh, this idea was introduced in 2015 by uh, Jian Feng and then later used by Lin Lin in the context of uh, plane waves. So what, what, uh, what, what we do is, let, let me just write down mu nu, uh, product of mu nu. Let me write this entire thing down as a big gigantic matrix where the rows are mu nu, and then uh, rows are uh, the grid points and the columns are mu nu. Now what I want to do is find some special grid points, psi, uh, and want to write all the other rows as a linear combination of these uh, values of uh, rows on these special grid points. Okay, so th this is what I'm going to do. And uh, to do this, uh, what I'll first do is, so, so the idea is very simple. You take this entire thing and do QR decomposition with pivoting, and the pivots uh, that you get out will give you the, uh, 
the most important grid points in the order that the pivots are uh, given out. Now this is an n cube operation and it turns out to be expensive. So what, what I do is I just uh, partition the entire space into Voronoi partitions. So take each atom and uh, uh, take a separate domain for each atom and do this decomposition in these small domains. And so get uh, these grid points for each atom separately. Uh, and turns out in the, in the actual algorithm, it doesn't really matter too much exactly what the grid points are. As long as they're reasonable, they work uh, fairly well. So, so this calculation now becomes order one, because you're doing a small uh, QR decomposition for each atom separately. Once you get these grid points, what now we are going to do is we're going to try to find these numerical orbitals. Uh, and we're going to try to find these numerical orbitals such that the product of this two is roughly equal to the, uh, the value of the product of the orbitals on the, all the grid points. And this can be done, this is a least square uh, type of problem, this can be solved. Uh, and again, this uh, n cube uh, calculation, but it turns out this is actually quite cheap. So like I said, n cube uh, operations are not always a killer if they have a small enough prefactor, and this uh, turns out to be a small, has a small prefactor, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't really uh, destroy the algorithm, it, it, it's quite cheap. So to summarize, uh, uh, what we do is there's one, uh, uh, a calculation once at the beginning of the, beginning of the calculation. You take these, uh, take these integrals, calculate these special points uh, xi. From these special points xi, you fit this uh, numerical orbital xi r, xi on the entire domain. Do FFT for each of this xi r. So uh, the xi r is a numerical orbital, calculate its potential. So you have to do um, uh, n log n operations n times, where n is the number of uh, xi. And so you, uh, so you have to do one time uh, calculation of n, n FFTs at the very beginning, and then you store the potential due to each of these numerical orbitals, and that's all. And now you can, you're ready to use uh, these, uh, uh, th this integral. And just to, just to be clear, we use this form, where uh, the robust uh, aspect, and you get an epsilon square error. So let me, uh, let me show you what the results look like. So here the result is for a relatively small system, lithium-4, uh, H4, double zeta basis. The number of basis functions is 60. In this, the number of grid points is 27,000. And this red occur, and, and here is the number of special points, the numerical basis, n psi, divided by the number of basis functions. So three would correspond to 180 grid points, four would correspond to 240 and so on. And this red is the tensor hypercontraction error. And blue is the error due to robust density fitting. And this uh, shaded region is the chemical accuracy. So already by the time you have taken 180 numerical orbitals, you are much below the chemical accuracy. And it uh, qu very quickly goes to almost basically zero error. Uh, and so this sort of, uh, Accuracy is consistent with when people use density fitting, except here uh, you, you're getting a much lower uh, calculation. Density fitting actually doesn't reduce the scaling of the exchange. Uh, now this, uh, this trend actually, uh, I could show you the same graph over and over again, but you just take my word for it. Uh, it holds for larger systems, larger basis sets, and some other systems that we have tried, like Diamond as well. Uh, I haven't done too extensive uh, tests because these calculations were run on my laptop, and run like a couple of days ago, but uh, roughly it seems like it, it, uh, the trend holds. Oh, can you come back? Yeah. So the number of read points, can you give sort of an intuition of uh, uh, what's the equivalent a grid at all for it or the distance? Yeah, yeah so the 27,000 uh, grid points correspond to about three or four grid points per Bore or angstrom? Uh, per, bo per bore, I think. Per bore, I think. So how does this depend if you change that? So the, the, this will be independent of your... Yeah, so this grid point is basically sufficiently dense that we have uh, saturated. the. Uh, so this, this is giving uh, us exact results for the Gaussian basis. That there's no error in the Gaussian basis at calculation. So this guy, this guy really depends on the basis functions that you've used, not so much on the grid. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, 
So then deep is it right to then think about the size of the grid being defined by a plane wave calculation, <coughs> a plane wave calculation in the tunnel? Yeah. That's like the upper part. Yeah, so the size of the grid is given by the size of the unit cell and uh, what uh, sort of pseudo potential you've used. So if you use a very hard pseudo potential, the grid point, the number of grid increases, otherwise it's, uh, for a softer run, it will be much sparser. So it's like similar to when you do AFQMC, like the results you showed, whatever grid you use there would be the grid that you use here to get rid of the, uh, but, but, but the grid is now acting like a density fitting basis, the results are not uh, grid results, they are the Gaussian basis results. Yeah, Mark? Do you have a grid aliasing problem, or is it? So what's the grid aliasing problem? So you move along. Uh, I haven't calculated. It the energy. <coughs> it, will, it will have a, uh, so in this case, I don't think it will be, because the grid is, uh, so the results that we are getting are Gaussian uh, our results because a Gaussian basis set and this grid is just a density fitting intermediate. Uh, I see. You can solve it if you use it. You can translate orbit Gaussian orbitals using a Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, then you would get the. I see. So I haven't calculated uh, forces and uh, stuff, and so I, I haven't done a careful analysis. Uh, but one of the things, I, you know, that we have learned so much about machine learning here that even if there are tiny wiggles, as long as you're feeding this to a, f a, f a force field of some sort, then it's. I think it's okay. You're just gonna. Are you using Mark's trick to representation for you of the? Is that necessary? Uh, so, which or it's, a, you, it's hard to converge this in three waves using so it's a compromise. You do some of it in real space. Oh yeah, so I'll I'll tell about uh, talk about this. So right now, this is all done in uh, with grid with uh, sufficiently uh, with the pseudo potential, so it doesn't cause a problem. No, this is for the Coulomb. That doesn't matter if pseudo. Have one over R for your transfer. The representation of that on a grid is strict. You're using the. I'm using FFT. FFT, exactly. Yeah. It's a way faster way to converge it grid side. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that, that, that was for. Uh, uh, we, we can chat more, but I thought that was for the open boundary condition, but, but that, that. You can use it. Okay. I'll, I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> So this is uh, th this uh, works uh, fairly well, uh, and th these are the these are these are the prefactors you get uh, for for this uh, uh, th th using this code. So the prefactors go down a fair bit by using robust pseudo spectral methods, but we can uh, improve them a little bit more. And the trick here is if you now look at a Fock operator, if you only wanted to calculate the energy, the only thing that you need from the Fock operator is the occupied, occupied part of the Fock operator. If you want to calculate occupied orbitals, that is if you want to do SCF, all you need is the occupied uh, AO part, this uh, rectangular piece of the Fock operator. So what, what we do is in SCF cycle, this is the only bit we ever construct. We never actually construct this entire thing. And this was the trick introduced, as far as I know, first by uh, Martin, and it's an essential ingredient in the AC algorithm of Linlin uh, uh, -Lin as well. So, so we can easily use this trick here. Uh, and uh, so we only ever evaluate Ki mu, where I is the occupied part mu is all the atomic orbitals. And then you get uh, pretty, uh, uh, even uh, further improvement by a factor of uh, four or five or something. And uh, you get, uh, uh, th these are the prefactors to go from uh, pure DFT to hybrid DFT. And so for something like lithium 32H2 on, on like my simple laptop takes about uh, 200 seconds to get the uh, entire uh, uh, Hartree Fock calculation uh, done. So now, <clears throat> very, uh, so th this is the, this is the uh, uh, total idea. Uh, now very briefly, I'll sketch, the, uh, sketch how one would do it if you didn't want to use the pseudo potential. So, well, well, uh, so let's say you have this uh, blue uh, Gaussian that is uh, fairly sharp. Um, the cold base is 
I haven't put it in PySCF yet. But it's not in CP2K. Oh, yeah, it's in, it's in PySCF, not CP2K. The other, before we move on, can I see the, the A plus delta plus B plus delta that we can? Because uh, that assumes A or B are the values in that. Yeah, so, so you see, exactly. on the right-hand side, we don't have a, a approximation. We make approximation only on the left-hand side. Or we keep the right-hand side the same and make the approximation on the left-hand side. So this is, uh, this is like putting a delta uh, on the A side here. This second is like putting a delta on the B here. So you take B plus delta. And this third is you put a delta uh, error on A and B. I mean, this is just a very rough schematic. It's, it doesn't match exactly. It doesn't match exactly. It's a rough, a rough schematic of uh, how to think about why there's a delta square error. Nonetheless, you can still show it rigorously. This is possible. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, this is shown in uh, uh, in uh, Ed's uh, paper. Where oh. where did the? Sorry, I mean, I, I'll show. I'll let's uh, show. Okay, it. yeah, that's what I used. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, Ed's paper. Ed Valave's paper is last year. Okay, so the simple trick uh, for, uh, uh, so this gets uh, sort of uh, technical, but let me just point this out. So let's say you have a blue Gaussian that is uh, fairly sharp, and you don't have enough uh, uh, plane waves to uh, completely uh, represent it. So what you do is you replace the blue Gaussian with a sufficiently smooth Gaussian uh, yellow, such that you can represent it in the plane wave basis that you have chosen for your problem. And then, uh, calculate the potential due to the yellow Gaussian. Of course, that's an error, because uh, you have now replaced blue with yellow. Now, if you actually try to see what the error is, which will be the uh, difference in potential due to blue and yellow, this turns out to be extremely short range, as long as the yellow is, you know, looks a little bit like blue. So it looks very extremely short range. So what we do here is we pick a sufficiently dense grid, such that the difference between the two Gaussians is extremely short range such that the difference uh, goes to zero uh, uh, as you go from one atom to the other. So you have a one atom centered Gaussian and the effect of this uh, perturbation will basically go to zero as long as you go to the next uh, atom. Yeah. I guess that's just schematic, right? Because the yellow charge is not the same as the blue charge. Yeah, yeah, it's just a schematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is schematic. <clears throat> a poor schematic, but yeah, yeah. What you have to have is charge, charge neutrality. And actually, so uh, I have to mention, so the potential goes to zero, and then there's an additional constant term, the background term, because of the charge, uh, uh, charge not being zero, and that, that is also there, but it's the same constant everywhere. So, so, uh, so this is just, uh, yeah, the, so you're right, yeah. So, so this is the thing uh, we use. So wherever you have a very sharp Gaussian, you just replace it with a smooth Gaussian. And uh, then uh, put it in your plane wave uh, code, calculate, do the uh, DFT like we did before. And then you have on center, on uh, 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 atom corrections. For each time you replace a sharp with a smooth, you get a small correction for each such replacement. So for example, <clears throat> you can now think about these integrals. There are several types of integrals, dd, dd, D, S, D, D, where D is diffuse, S is sharp. So as long as one side is at least diffuse, you can do the entire calculation in plane waves. So even if the one side is sharp and one side is diffuse, this can, entire thing can be calculated using just plane waves. There are some integrals like S, 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 D, where the S, D or S, S has to be replaced by a sufficiently smooth thing, and then you have to do a short range correction, which, uh, which I'm not showing, but it can be done. Uh, and for, to do this, we actually implemented some uh, uh, special integrals, which are mixed Gaussian plane wave integrals, to, to take care of the short range uh, correction part. Uh, and so if you want to read these two are technical papers, if you're into that kind of thing, you can have a look. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so I showed you there was roughly around 200 seconds with pseudo potentials. If you do an all electron, the cost is a little bit more, but it's not dramatically more. It's about 350 seconds. For for all electron uh, calculation, uh, lithium 32H2 with double zeta basis set. Now, one of the advantages is because we have mixed Gaussian plane wave basis, 
um, in, the, in the sort of uh, semi-long run, what I want to do is replace these diffuse orbitals completely with plane waves. So I want to write a code that is a fully mixed Gaussian plane wave code where the Gaussians only take care of the sharp part and the plane waves are basically helping you converge to the basis set limit. But, but you know, that, that'll take a little bit of time to sort of put it all together. So that was the <clears throat> end of the first part. Uh, am I almost done? What time is it? Okay. Okay. A any question for the first part before I move on to the second? Okay, so the, in the second part, I'll tell you how AFQMC can use multislater wave functions. So AFQMC, I mean, uh, Shiva already introduced the idea quite uh, uh, beautifully yesterday. This uh, effectively does a imaginary time propagation. You take Schrodinger equation, replace the time with imaginary time, and you get this, uh, this equation. You can propagate it forward. Uh, no matter what uh, size zero you start with, as long as you propagate far enough, you will end up with the ground state if, if, you have, if your psi naught has a, some non-zero overlap with the ground state. Uh, and the, uh, this, uh, this is uh, true for uh, all uh, projector Monte Carlos. The, uh, the unique defining feature of AFQMC is that it treats this exponential of a one-body operator exactly using Tauler's theorem. And the two-body operator you treat using hubbard stratonovich transformation. So, for example, in DMC, the roles are completely reversed. You treat the two-body part exactly and the one-body part uh, stochastically, here you do it the other way around. Uh, now the point is, as, as you start to propagate it, you will eventually uh, get a sign problem and your uh, signal becomes too noisy. And so you want to uh, somehow solve the sign problem. Uh, there are uh, two ways you can do it, free projection and uh, phaseless approximation, which uh, Shive talked about yesterday. Phaseless approximation introduces a bias, but hopefully a small bias, uh, and uh, you get uh, reasonable results. Free projection is exact. So the way free projection uh, to think about here is, okay, as you propagate forward in time with sufficiently large tau, you will get very noisy. So this is a battle, bet uh, and, but the energy is also decaying exponentially. So it's a battle between two exponentials. If, you're, if you're en you start with a wave function that's close enough to the ground state such that you converge to the exact energy before the noise kills you, then uh, you, you, you're the big winner, right? Otherwise, you're a loser. So not you, me. So, uh, so this is uh, so. So you want to start with a wave function that is sufficiently good, such that with a small uh, projection, you already come to the ground state before the noise is no, noise becomes unbearable. So the uh, the way we do this is the following. Uh, so the uh, so the this is again to remind you what we are doing. We start with a psi zero, project it forward tau h. And uh, once you project it forward, at the end of it, you calculate uh, some energy with a trial state. Uh, so here, what, uh, 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 the thing to note is, when you're doing this imaginary time propagation, psi zero is some linear combination of all the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. This projection exponentially quickly projects out high-lying states. As if the energy of the... Uh, state contributing to psi naught is high, then it will decay exponentially fast. And if there are some states that are uh, contributing to psi naught that are close to the ground state, then they take very, very long time to, uh, uh, to clean up. So this left-hand side is very good at quote-unquote dynamical correlation. Uh, contributions from very large number of very high-lying states can be projected out quite quickly on the left-hand side. And then we, we use HCI. HCI is the multi-slater uh, uh, selected CI flavor that we've been working on. What HCI does is you take uh, this uh, degenerate manifold of orbitals and diagonalize the Hamiltonian in that manifold. And all the low-lying energy levels live in this tiny manifold. So on the, uh, on the, on the bra side, you are now... Uh, you have a state that has a very low contribution from low-lying excited states. On the cat side, you have a wave function very, uh, with low contribution from the high-lying excited states, and you uh, put them together, you get an uh, energy which has a, a fairly good uh, uh, accuracy. So you've, you've been able to get rid of both, uh, both those kind of things. So <clears throat> another thing we want to do is psi naught. Usually people start with Hartree-Fock. But there's no need to do that. If you can afford to do couple cluster, you can start with a couple cluster wave function. 
And the, and the thing is, couple cluster has exactly the same form as the exponential of the Hamiltonian, as the exponential of a two-body operator. You can do the hubbard sertanovich transformation trick that you use for e to the tau h exactly with couple cluster. So, so the entire algorithm, uh, uh, you start with couple cluster, which already has very low contribution from high-lying states, project for a sufficiently small time that you get rid of these, and then uh, take the trial state as the HCI to calculate the energy. How come HCI has no low energy? Like no, I mean, <laughs> ground state. So ground state, uh, low energy besides ground state. Uh, so because you're doing it in a, a degenerate manner, you're diagonalizing a Hamiltonian, the sort of degenerate manifold, you have eliminated contribution from the low-lying excited states. And you're, uh, it has contribution from high lying. You know, it doesn't get you dynamical correlation, which sort of says, you know, you have these tiny but many, many contributions from high lying states that you can't get rid of. But low lying excitations, you have sort of uh, uh, removed them a little bit. So this, uh, this, uh, uh, this is sort of a toy problem, but it gives you a flavor of how this works. This green line is the AFQMC. You start with Hartree Falk and then you uh, move forward. Uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, red line is HCI, but you start with Hartree Fock and you get this. Blue line is couple cluster. The starting energy is lower than uh, Hartree HCI, but HCI has smaller low-lying uh, energy contribution, so HCI actually converges a little bit faster than uh, couple cluster, although the initial energy of couple cluster is lower. But if you combine the two, it uh, converges better than both of them. So this, this way of doing it helps you uh, get uh, quote-unquote exact results for bigger systems than you would be otherwise able to do. So there's a, uh, of course, this, this entire trick can be used for phaseless AFQMC as well. So the trial state and the bias that you introduce uh, uh, can be corrected using HCI instead of hartree fock um, uh, to, uh, to do the to this, uh, same thing, to use it in phaseless AFQMC. So just scaling, uh, scaling of HCI, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a, in a second. The, the, of course, the overall algorithm is still exponential because it is, <laughs> you know. But uh, the scaling because of HCI, I'll show you in a moment. It's actually quite uh, good. So uh, le let me just uh, give you the results. So this is a uh, toy problem that we are trying to look at. You take copper and break, uh, push the copper together and breaks the oxygen bond. It's like a messy, quite a messy problem. And if you look at the results, of the barrier height, this minus this, it's all over the place. And with, uh, with this uh, flavor of free projection AFQMC, we can basically get the exact result. And there were some phaseless uh, ca uh, AFQMC calculations with sort of no C, like a uh, few, uh, maybe a hundred non-orthogonal CI trial states. That has, uh, you know, it's a, it's a six kilocalper uh, mole error. Now we can go to 50K at CI, selected CI determinants quite uh, efficiently, and with that we get uh, energies that are consistent with our uh, free projection. And the reason we are able to do this is because of this uh, algorithm. So if you do the multi slater completely naively, the cost of the calculation will uh, scale linearly with the number of determinants. ND multiplied by N raised to 4. N raised to 4 is roughly the at CI uh, AFQMC cost, and ND is the number of slater determinants in your expansion. And the blue line is the new algorithm, which goes n d n plus n to the four. So on this linear scale, you can't even see the increase, but it does increase. Uh, so this uh, this is uh, this is the curve. This h fifty in some stretch geometry with the uh, uh, RHF and a multi slater uh, 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 multi slater sort of uh, expansion. This is the energy. It in, uh, decreases. The error in energy decreases. The cost of the calculation is uh, yellow. Uh, it uh, increases, but the effective cost, because you're using a, tr a good trial state, the noise in the uh, result is smaller. So the effectively actually uh, makes the calculation cheaper because you're, with the same uh, effort, you're getting much uh, lower noise. So about 10 raised to four determinants actually reduces the noise, but eventually it takes over. So you're almost uh, better off just doing it. Uh, yeah. I have a question about the slide where you show different methods. What happened with CASPT2 there? CASPT2 as the trial state, I don't, uh, I don't know how to use that in this context. No, I mean, so the table on the next slide? 
Oh, okay, that's PT2. Uh, what, what happens for... Uh, here, yeah, here. You mean why is this so terrible? Yes. I don't know. Hmm? Gas PT2 is like a little bit of a lottery, I think, sometimes. Uh, okay, this is... Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to skip this. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to skip this because I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, okay, but maybe just... Okay, I, I'll run out of time. So uh, I want to thank uh, Greg Belkin, with whom I've collaborated on the exchange part of the code and this is my group and Ankit was the student who did most of the work on AFQMC. He's uh, joining uh, Dave Reichman's group and hopefully we'll be able to work with uh, Shiva next year when he gets to Columbia. And thank you all for sticking around. Yeah.